Hi, I'm Dr. Giovanni Rondo, host of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, where our goal is the improvement of the entire world with a particular focus on the local African American community. We are going, continuing to go through a pandemic, and we have been literally traumatized. So today, we're going to be talking at length about trauma in all its different forms. So I have a wonderful guest <laughs> who actually is a member of St. Stephen's. So one of the things we kind of like to do here at St. Stephen's is showcase some of our wonderful members who are a part of the medical establishment. So I have a wonderful guest today, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself and tell what you do and, and, and how you got into the medical field. Well, hello, I am Kim Wilson, Welcome. and I'm the Director of Critical Care Services and Dialysis for UofL Health, and I am at University Hospital, which is a part of the UofL Health family. Okay, mm -hmm. now tell us how you got into the medical field. Um, actually, I can honestly say nursing is what God created me to do. Mm -hmm. it, I didn't always know that. Mm -hmm. it took me a while to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't become a nurse till I was 30, so I'll be 51 this year, so wow. you know, oh, 20 years in, but you know, yeah. finally at 30, I was like, okay, this is what God has created me to do. So what did you do before nursing? Uh, I actually worked for Humana Insurance Company. Okay, yeah, okay. So, yeah. All right, so yeah. you've had pretty yeah. uh But nursing diverse. is truly a passion. Truly, I mean, I am blessed to say that as hard as a day might be at work or mm -hmm. sometimes you get frustrated, I truly would not want to do anything else. Awesome. It's truly my passion. So, speaking of which, tell us what a typical day is like for you. Um, well, with my position, you know, I'm Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. but do have 24-hour accountability. Mm. So, you know, with our hospital, there, are, you know, it's 24/7 business. So, you know, there are constantly things going on. So, you do have to be available. But on a particular day, um, I am responsible for nine critical care areas mm. and the dialysis. So just, you know, checking in with those managers of those areas, with the staff, um, you know, seeing what cases maybe came in during the night or mm -hmm. over the weekend if I come back on a Monday, and just, you know, dealing with the financial aspect of it, quality initiatives, mm -hmm. you know, patient experience, staff engagement, so all those things go along with the position. Golly, you have a lot of responsibilities, mm -hmm. a lot. So in terms of just nursing overall, do you actually continue to participate in the nursing field in terms of nursing patients or is more administrative? Uh, more administrative. Mm -hmm. I have not been a bedside nurse for a while. However, I still require to keep my license and credentialing still, you know, certified in it, you know, have ACLS certification, mm -hmm. you know, um, CPR certification, things like that. I'm still specialized um, in critical care nursing and have all those certifications. Um, you know, when I'm on the unit, you know, I can, you know, if, if a nurse is busy, I can pass a med still. I can, you know, mm -hmm. help take care of a patient, do something with an IV pump, start an IV. So I can still do those type of, you know, skills, but I don't per se have a team of patients that I take care of every day. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But you still have to keep your skills together. Almost oh, definitely, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. yes, and, yes. And actually, I have to say that uh, you uh, taught me uh, just recently, <laughs> because when we were doing the vaccine Same clinic, yeah. vaccine I clinic injections. <laughs> yes, she does injections very, very well. So she, and I'm a little rusty. I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah. And, and then we as doctors, we tend to give the orders yeah. for them, not mm -hmm. necessarily do them ourselves. So mm -hmm. thank you for, oh, you're welcome. for being you're so great job. Me. Yes, yes, I, I, I did the best that I could. <laughs> yes. So, so you work in critical care, you work mm -hmm. and you see a trauma, potentially trauma. Can you explain to us what a level one trauma center, uh, you know, is? Mm -hmm. So a level level one trauma center is certified by the American College of Surgeons. So with UofL being a level one trauma center, we are able to take care of all types of injuries 24 seven. Mm. So if there is an accident or some type of traumatic event, anywhere in the city, in the region, because we do have patients that are sent to us. We have ORs that operate 24 hours a day. We have all specialties 24 hours a day. So if you needed a trauma surgeon, if you needed neurosurgery, if you needed orthopedics. They're there. They are there, along wow. with the specialized nursing care. So whatever happens, we can handle it 24 seven. Awesome, mm -hmm. so if someone, you know, don't want this to happen, but if someone is in an accident yes. or gunshot mm -hmm. wound, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
24-7 University of Louisville Trauma Center mm -hmm. is available. Right, okay. and so we service the region because there, as far as adult level one, there's us and there's UK and Lexington. Okay. So if something okay. happens across the bridge in Clarksville, there's not a trauma, they would have to send them to us. Or if something happens um, maybe in E-Town, that person needs okay. to come to us for level one trauma care. From the region from in the and of region, itself. Not well, just in the city, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so because we're so close to Indiana, in a, mm -hmm. they can actually, mm -hmm. wow, well that's good because mm -hmm. I, I do live in, <laughs> in Indiana. So yeah. if there's uh -huh. anything that happens, yeah. that's great. Yeah. So we're in great care yeah. or great uh, mm -hmm. hands mm -hmm. when it comes to the University of Louisville. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So who actually would benefit most in that kind of a setting, just overall? Um, in the trauma setting? Mm -hmm. Um, well, <clears throat> we do a lot of trauma patients, and a lot of people think that that's all we do. That, you know, okay. we, do, we don't do anything with trauma, but we do a lot of elective, you know, services. We have our oncology services, mm -hmm. we have our women's services, our her, th her third floor is a NICU and labor and delivery mm -hmm. and mother baby. Now, we do specialize in high risk, and unfortunately, yes. sometimes we have traumatic events with, you know, pregnant women Birth, because they yeah. get in car accidents and things like that, so we take care of that. Um, but we do have a lot of patients who come for scheduled, you know, knee surgeries or back surgeries or whatever the case may be. But, you know, most people know us as the trauma hospital. Right. And to me, I know it sounds kind of weird, but that's actually very reassuring that we have, you know, a level one trauma center mm -hmm. so close mm -hmm. and that we can access those services, mm -hmm. you know. And I do remember um, actually being in medical school and dealing with some of the different things mm -hmm. and things that you would see, um, not just you know, um, in the emergency room, but also the burn unit. You also yes, mentioned mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, so tell us more about the, the burn unit. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, when I first started university, I was a burn nurse. That's where I, oh, that's where I started okay. when I came out of nursing school. So that is probably part of my passion, too, is mm -hmm. I just love taking care of burn unit and caring for their families. But um, we have a 16-bed mm -hmm. burn unit. Um, so, and we are also going for national verification for our burn unit. By um, from through the ABA, which is the American Burn Association. Wow, so that's pretty we, impressive. Yeah, so we have quality initiatives and different things that we're putting in place to say that we maintain a high level of burn care. So once again, even with our our burn unit, we see people from around the region, and we have a burn clinic where we see um, patients in an outpatient setting. So maybe they're in Bowling Green, and their burn wasn't so bad. They needed to come to us, but they still need to be seen by somebody who specialize in burn care. So we have the whole telehealth um, concept oh. that we can do with our burn patients too. So wow, we have that's a lot pretty of things novel. That, yeah. Did that just come about with the pandemic or that's been something that has been in place? That was already in place, but then with the oh. pandemic, it kind of just took off even more. Accelerated it, mm -hmm. right, right. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. other ways has the pandemic affected you and, and the things that you see and do uh, there at, at University of Louisville? Um, I'm sure you and a lot of other healthcare professionals have said, you know, with the pandemic, one, that's something I thought I would never see in my career, first of all. I'll be the first. I just never didn't imagine that. And so now, you know, the 17, 18 months almost out of it, you're just kind of like, wow, like, did we just do that? You yes. know, um, have you we know, just gone through this traumatic yeah, event? You know, literally. You know, yeah, like, you know, wearing the mask all the time and you know having the stations at the table where visitors had to take their tips to come and in being and, distant and being distant mm -hmm. and every you know everything going to zoom i think what was really hard as healthcare workers when we went through that period of just one visitor or no visitors yes. which for us in traumatic situations was very hard mm -hmm. because you know if you were COVID, of course you didn't get any visitors because right. you, you know it couldn't at the time for right. safety um but then, you know, when we went to just two visitors, if somebody was passing away, just because at the height of COVID, you couldn't, you know, had to do the distancing. Yeah. So you had people that were passing away with no one with there no one or there. just two yeah. people there and families were having to make a choice, which two people go. That was very hard. That yes. was very hard. And that, I mean, that's probably something I'll never forget. That, yes. that was hard. That was, yeah, that was very hard. Now that in and of itself sounds like it's traumatizing. It you was know, just overall. It was. I mean, you know, our our nurses who worked on the COVID unit, they were amazing. And at the height of the pandemic, um, when, like I said, the COVID patients had absolutely no visitation and they were literally passing away alone. And you had nurses who just were holding a hand and an iPad in their hand. And yes. so the family could see them on the iPad. Oh, and and, and that out. was it. I mean, that was so hard. 
on yes. our nurses and, and physicians too. But I mean, yes. it was just really hard on the bedside nurse, you know, who usually was the person there. Who's just right there. Just right there right holding there. that person's hand so they didn't have to die alone. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is, so how do you all as a, you're an administrator, so how mm -hmm. do you deal with that? How do you deal with the trauma that is for the caregivers in and of themselves? How do you all, you know, what kinds of techniques or what kinds of tips or what types of things that you put into place to protect the caregivers, the nurses and the physicians mm -hmm. um, during this time? Um, to be honest, I think we were in the middle of it. We were just kind of going, going, going. Mm -hmm. You know how sometimes mm -hmm. when you're in a stress mode, you're just reacting and when you were going and then coming out of it, it was almost like, Wait a minute. <laughs> did we just go through that? Yeah, you yeah. know, you, you, we really did have to have some debriefing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I know a lot of organizations that we did too, you know, mm -hmm. gave the COVID bonuses mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. But emotionally, though, a, lot of the, a lot of the staff, they, they had to debrief. They had really yes. had to, yes. you know, talk about what they felt. Um, it was extremely hard for the new people coming in because you had new yes. grad nurses. Yes. Who, you know, they were fresh out of nursing school. And the first thing they went into was the pandemic. So that was wow. very, you and know, not to mention, for you know, medical students also. But yeah, and medical some of the students. I mean, residents you know, respiratory and, therapists, yeah. physical yes. therapists. I mean, the Just unsung the heroes, the unsung heroes, the housekeepers, the yes. dietary, the people like that. You know, who worked and you know went into the COVID rooms and you know, you know, befriended patients because you know, if you didn't have any visitors, probably the only person you saw was your nurse, the housekeeper, the doc, you know, and things wow. like that. So yeah, it was. It, I it, never, it was, gosh, you, you're really giving me a different perspective of that. I don't mm -hmm. go to the hospitals anymore like I used to. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, definitely yeah. a different perspective mm -hmm. of, yeah, the housekeeper, dietitian, or the, the you that, know, people yeah. who bring the yeah. food and then mm -hmm. the nurses and yeah. then mm -hmm. maybe a few doctors here and there. So, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. pretty incredible. Yeah. Your only contact was when those people came into your yeah. room. Yeah. And hopefully you were well enough to FaceTime your family. Mm -hmm. Wow, that mm -hmm. is a lot. That's a lot to mm -hmm. go through. That actually reminds me, it, it's like our whole world has been traumatized, but it mm -hmm. reminds me of the time I lived in New York during 9-11. And so mm -hmm. we had a lot of the, the, the people who didn't survive um, mm -hmm. um, during 9-11 or who were brought in and maybe sent to other places like burn units or whatnot. We were the closest mm -hmm. uh, hospital uh, to the, the, the Twin Towers. So I do remember it just being a very difficult time and it being very traumatizing and that we had to debrief mm -hmm. in and of itself, all of us, you know, who were working on the floors and working mm -hmm. in the different units. Mm -hmm. um, and gosh, I can't believe it's been almost 20 years, I know. you know, with in that. September. So in September, <laughs> September yeah, yeah, well, it, it's yeah. coming up. So yeah, so, yeah, so it, sound, it seems like the whole world has kind of been traumatized yeah. to a certain degree, yeah. you know, with this, yeah. with this, this pandemic. Yeah. And so just mentally, um, there's just that mental trauma of, mm -hmm. of what's, you know, going on. Um, we have the physical trauma of, mm -hmm. of, of the pandemic and all the other things. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we as African-Americans, we've, you know, been dealing with some of the racial protests, not mm -hmm. just African-Americans, mm -hmm. what I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, just as a, as a group. Mm -hmm. So how, how are you dealing with that? And how is the university, you know, just helping people through that whole process, just the mental um, uh, issues with, not just the pandemic, mm -hmm. but some of the, the racial uh, protests that have gone on too. Um, well, you know, when we did have the, you know, the protests downtown, mm -hmm. you know, that um, it, it could be, it was challenging, mm -hmm. you know, some days, mm -hmm. you know, because, um, you know, you kind of had to be, you were kind of on high alert. For, Very much for, so. You know, you were hope, you know, the protests for the most part, they were peaceful, but you, we had to be prepared because we're the only level one trauma center in the city. We had mm -hmm. to be prepared for, Anything whatever, for whatever anything, happens, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, you know, thank goodness we weren't used, you know, to that degree. But, you know, even with the trauma of the pandemic, there was the trauma of the, you know, emotional trauma for the staff as far as the COVID patients. Mm -hmm. But the other traumas didn't stop. You know, now I, w I will say we probably noticed a decrease in car accidents and things like that. Like when people mm -hmm. were, you know, when things were shut down because people weren't out and about weren't as, much, as much. But yeah. people still were, you know, getting in car accidents. You know, there were still assaults. There mm -hmm. were still you know, gunshot victims. There were still people being burned in house fires. So we, yeah. all of that stuff still continued, yeah. you yeah. know, for us. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is a lot. Yeah. That's so we had lot. all of that plus COVID. Right. <laughs> so yeah. when, when people are in, so just for our viewers, when people are in the ICU, the intensive care unit, I should say, mm -hmm. the 
CCU, the coronary care unit, the SICU, the surgical mm -hmm. uh, intensive care unit, what kinds of things are you know important for people and, and family members to know um, about those experiences there and what they should do? And then also, what types of things should they do to avoid even getting into you know, the mm -hmm. ICU, the CCU, mm -hmm. and the SICU? Um, well, families and patients and families should know that, you know, we are prepared. You know, mm -hmm. I tell my nurses all the time, it might be the 500th time we've done something, but mm -hmm. it's that family's first time. Right. You know, right. we see, you know, the car accidents and the gunshot victims every day, all but it's time, not there yeah. every day. So, you know, you have to be mindful of that. But, you know, when families come in, the first people they're going to see are the people in our ER department mm -hmm. who, you know, do an excellent job. And, you know, they they, they see, unfortunately, a lot of people don't even get past the ER. You know, the, the event is so tragic that they mm -hmm. pass away in the ER. They don't make it upstairs to our inpatient mm -hmm. units. So, you know, they deal with the aftermath of, you know, the emotion because, you know, literally you at the kitchen table with somebody two hours ago. And then you get a phone call from me saying, I'm yes. so sorry, can you please get to University Hospital as soon as you can? Yes. And you've dis disrupted someone's world. Whole life. Whole yeah. life, completely, yeah. completely. Wow. So, you know, we, you know, our ER is set up, once again, you know, to handle anything. You can go straight from the ER to the OR in less than five minutes, you know, if you have to. If you need a CT, you know, CT scan, so it's all right ready. there. Yes, I mean, you know, 24-7, yeah. mm -hmm. there are trauma ORs that are up and running and ready you know depending on the level of trauma it is you know there's a special page that goes out to doctors you know when EMS mm -hmm. calls and says you know this person has this type of injury their vital signs are this there's a criteria that we have and if it meets a high level doctors you literally have trauma attendings in the are waiting as soon as you roll in the door there's trauma attendings there right. so in addition to the fellows, the and the uh, nurses, residents, and the, the respiratory nurses, therapists, and the medical and the, students, and, yes, and, and the yeah. ER techs, and yes. everyone, yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, very mm -hmm. well. Uh, yes, and then staffed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then depending on what type of injury or you know medical condition you have, you would go upstairs to one of our critical care areas. Now each of our units have their own specialty, but all of the nurses are specialized to take care of any type of patient. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our trauma patients tend to go to uh, our units 9 West and 8 West because mm -hmm. those are the trauma ICUs. But if they go to 5 West, which is our neural ICU, they can take care of them as well. So, wow. you know, even our burn unit, you know, you know, they take the overflow of the car accidents and sometimes the gunshot, you know, victims too, as well. Ooh, that is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. Now, so you also mentioned, let's see, the you also run the dialysis unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tell us about a little bit about that in terms of, it's not necessarily trauma or traumatic, but there's mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, the, I mean, that unit that. is very self-sufficient. It mm -hmm. pretty much runs itself. Those nurses, once again, are very specialized in what they do. And then um, if depending on a patient, they might come actually into the dialysis unit to get their dialysis. Mm -hmm. Or if they're in the critical care area, those patients stay in their room. And the dialysis nurse brings the machine so to the goes room. to them, mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so tell us, what do you enjoy most about what you do, what you're doing right now? Mm, I would just making a difference because, mm -hmm. you know, when patients come in, they are devastated. You know, depend. You know, not not always. You know, sometimes they're just upset, but sometimes they are just really devastated. They don't know um, are the person going to make it or you know. They're not going to make it, we're telling them. And so just being able to be there for them yeah. and to be a support for them and to just trying to explain. Because, you know, the bedside nurses, they're so busy. You know, they're taking care of the patient, you know. And sometimes, you know, I have the benefit and it's also, I see it as a blessing too, to be able to care for the family member, yes. to be able to yes. pull the, the spouse to the side or the parent or the child and be like, how can I answer your questions? How can I help you through this? Did you understand everything, you know, the doctor said? Did mm -hmm. you understand what the nurse said? Mm -hmm. You know, can I answer these questions for you? What is, you know, what does this mean? Sometimes they just need to let you, let them cry. Yes. You know, yes. sometimes they just need to yell, <laughs> you know, depending on what you've told them. Mm -hmm. They are literally just screaming and you just have to help them through that. Through that. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like, um, that, that's great that you are able to mm -hmm. kind of provide some backup to the nurses yes. there and mm -hmm. the staff mm -hmm. there and uh, just also provide that compassion because mm -hmm. you know I know you so you're very <laughs> compassionate yeah. and 
and uh, explain things very, mm -hmm. very well. So thank you for what you do. Mm -hmm. So as a frontline healthcare worker, what kinds of changes would you like to see in terms of how we deal with trauma or how trauma is just dealt with overall? Are there any things that you would like to see? Um, improvements, any type of technological advancements and anything? Um, I think, you know, right now, I think on the news, you know, everybody's talking about, you know, we've reached what, 100 homicides, you know, this year, which is, mm -hmm. you know, very, very it's sad. I do think that a lot of times people don't realize there are a lot more that are, that are shot, that have devastating injuries. Yes. You know? Yes. So, you know, to see things probably in place more for the survivors of those, mm -hmm. you know, of those gunshot, you know, of those shootings, you know, you know, people maybe who now are, uh, they can't walk anymore, or, you know, they're, have a traumatic brain injury. You know, and they're they're just never the same. You know, so you know why why death is hard. You know, sometimes the survival is very hard, hard as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, wow, I never thought about that. That's mm -hmm. a great point. So mm -hmm. basically, more support, yes, uh, and more help for the people who actually survive. Yes, uh, those yes. traumatic things, yes. whether it's gunshot wounds yes. or or yeah. car accidents, yeah. the yeah. survivors. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, there are some great organizations out mm -hmm. there, especially with gun violence. You know, Christopher 2X and his organization, yes. Yes. he's doing some great work, you know, yes. doing some great work. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we, we sometimes see a gunshot victim more than once, twice, three times, wow. you know. Wow. And, or, or, you know, if a nurse remembers you from the last time you were mm -hmm. shot, you know, Right. That's bad. Or, you know, even with the car accidents, you know, dealing with, you know, or when a, a, you know, burn victims, you know, dealing with the aftermath of that, how they look and things like right. that. Just having all those support things, you know, in place for that. Well, that's great. That's great. So let's see. On Healthy Mind, Body and Spirit, we talk a lot about um, health mm -hmm. and we do a lot of talking, but we also like to be about health. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of things do you do to, you know, just make sure that you stay as healthy as possible? Um, from a trauma aspect, I would say I would encourage everyone to wear their seatbelt. Okay. Wear their seatbelt. So you belt. always wear your seatbelt? I always okay. wear my seatbelt. Okay. Always wear my, always make sure my child <laughs> has his seatbelt yes, on. Yes, um, The sweet seatbelts do amazing. <laughs> they, <laughs> they do. Just, they work wonders. Yes. Um, and it's kind of amazing when I think about, like, my childhood. Uh, of course, of course, I don't let my child go without a seatbelt, but I remember actually sitting oh, I do too. without seatbelts <laughs> yeah, all the time, time. Until, yeah, all yeah. the time, I think until I was like a teenager yeah. or whatnot, but yeah, that wasn't yeah. something that, you know, we yeah. did, but now times have changed, yeah. and so we've kind of advanced. Yeah, and we, you so, do better when you, you know better, because exactly, you do better. Exactly, do better, yeah. um, You know, so, um, so, you know, and plus we don't have the distracted driving. Like, you know, when would you, you say yeah. that that's something that uh, is, is big in terms of traumas now, in terms of mm -hmm. car accidents, the distractedness I'm sure, of, of I'm driving? Sure, I don't know the exact numbers on that, mm -hmm. but I'm sure, you know, that is some of the accidents, you know, that we do see is, you know, distracted um, driving, mm -hmm. um, driving under the influence, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, motorcycles, not wearing a helmet. Okay. Please okay. wear a helmet if you're on a motorcycle. Yes. You yes. know, it's devastating to see a patient, you know, they're they were in a motorcycle and their body is maybe a scratch or two and it's all a head injury. All a head oh, injury. Oh, wow. They it comes from not wearing their, the, their If they would have had a helmet, helmet on, they would have walked away. They would have just got up from the bike from the accident wow. and walked away. Wow. So yeah. what is it about it? Is it just they don't want to be confined? Is it? Or, yeah, okay, I don't maybe know. You, I don't, you I don't know. know. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know, but you know, but, you know wearing a helmet is huge. Wearing a seatbelt, mm -hmm. having a smoke detector in your home. Okay, okay. Yeah, also very important. And make sure that it works yes, and it has batteries. Yes, batteries, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and just fire safety, having a fire extinguisher in your kitchen, you know, mm. watching the hot the temperature of your hot water, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. Anything else that you would advise people to do on a regular basis to prevent themselves from going into, you know, the level one trauma center if, if necessary? It, one thing I have to say in terms of just the gun violence, is there anything that we can do to try to stave that off? I know we talk a lot about uh, the policies, gun policies, but are there things in our communities that we could do to, pro to, to I don't know, um, curb it, you mm -hmm. know, to stop it or, or to, yeah. to lessen? Yeah. You know, I think our pastor, I think Reverend Cosby says it a lot better mm -hmm. <laughs> than, than I could. 
you know, there are, are numerous factors, whether you get into the economics mm -hmm. and poverty mm -hmm. and things like that. There's a lot of things that, you know, get to the root of why you have crime and, you know, the, you know, not, you know, the gun laws, you know, I don't, I personally, as a lay person, don't understand why, you know, someone has a better gun than a police officer would carry. Why do you need an AK-47? You don't hunt right. with that. You know, right. why does, right. why should I, you know, be able to just walk up and buy an assault rifle, no questions asked? I, I you yeah. know, I think, you know, it, it's bigger than probably anything that, you know, So maybe I can better solve. restrictions yeah, overall, you know, yeah. changing the policies. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but I will say, from what I see, the effects of gun violence, you know, are devastating. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many, you know, mothers and fathers mm -hmm. and sisters and brothers and grandparents and husbands and wives and kids just devastated because yeah. because somebody just decided to shoot a gun instead of trying to solve the issue. Mm -hmm. And to see young people, 15, yes. 16, you know. With so many years of life. So many years of, live. you know, so your yeah. life, and, yeah. you know, and the, the most, the best thing that can come out of it is maybe if they become an organ donor, mm -hmm. you know, and then they save lives, you know. Save several lives. Several lives, lives you know. Depending. I mean, yeah. not, you know, several months ago, I had a mother, you know, she was like, you know, at least my child could help somebody do something that they never got to do. Graduate college, get married, have kids. You know, all that was gone from her. But, you know, her child was going to be able to help somebody do all of that. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is a lot. So one of the things that um, I would say in terms of maybe helping is what in terms of like helping people to deal with anger, helping people mm -hmm. to um, be um, solvers of solutions mm -hmm. in a nonviolent yes. manner. Yes. Um, so just whatever ways that we can, yes. you know, help people to do that or help ourselves to do that. Yeah. Like when we have conflict, yes. how can we handle that um, outside of, you know, but being yeah, angry yeah, yeah. Or, or, or showing. So, you know, I guess being angry is, is, is a part and, of human right. emotions. Right. But, but you know, how we, young we handle people that. But we get in a fight. Yeah. You know, yeah. if somebody yelled fight, the most you're going right. to think of is some, somebody fist fighting. Fight. Yeah. Right, right. I've never ducked. I mean, <laughs> when I was in school or whatever the case may be, I didn't worry about, oh, somebody's going to pull a gun. I just, have a gun. Right, yeah, you didn't right. even think about that. Didn't even think about yeah. that. You but know, now this now is our reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's our reality. You know, you, you mean our kids are the same age, yeah, Lola and yeah. Brayden. Right, right. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, and think about like school shootings and things like uh, that. I mean, that is just something we would never think of when we were our age. And yeah. now as parents, we have to. It's a reality you know, of now. Yeah, yeah, like they have drills for that. Yes. That's just, I mean, that's yeah. sad to me. I do remember that my fire child drills, has to have a drill for fire, fire drill fire drills, tornadoes and tornado drills, yeah. but not gun Act, violence Now drills. they have active shooter drills. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's sad that yeah. my son knows what an active yeah. shooter drill is. Yeah. But we we have it at work too, you yeah. Know? So you're we right. have to have we it do. in the workplace. We do. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we we do definitely need to um, have policies um, that help, but also on a more personal, just everyone, how we deal with conflict. Yes, I mm -hmm. think is 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 something that you know we all need to talk yeah. about. But thank you so much. This has really been a great conversation. Well, thank you, Ms. Wilson, me. for coming in today. Thank you. As a member of St. Stephen, you know, I think maybe people may see you, but to know more of what you do, you know, is, is great. And to know that at the University of Louisville Hospital, a level one trauma center, that someone who's compassionate and so knowledgeable and is, is there to help take mm -hmm. care of, of people in unfortunate ways, mm -hmm. you know, in unfortunate circumstances. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, where our emphasis is improving our entire world with a particular focus on the local African-American community. Thanks for joining us. Truth, justice, power, it's TV our way. <laughs>